Hello, my name is Paul Friedman, Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by my colleague, Dr. Alan Luis, who's co-director of the Pericardial Clinic, director of the Medical Sonographer Education Program, as well as an Associate Professor of Medicine. And Alan, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. And so today we're going to talk about pericardiosynthesis, a procedure that can be life-saving, diagnostic, but for many clinicians can cause some measure of anxiety because it's not commonly done in their potential risks. So maybe why don't we start with the indications? When are you most commonly doing a pericardiosynthesis? That's a great question, Paul. So the usual indication for a pericardiosynthesis is a large or a significant pericardial effusion resulting in cardiac tamponade. These effusions, it's important to remember if they're acute, they may appear to be fairly small. It's the speed that, with which the effusion accumulates that results in tamponade. Um, so really cardiac tamponade tends to be the main reason for performing a pericardiosynthesis. The other major reason for performing a pericardiosynthesis is a significant pericardial effusion in which you don't know the etiology for treatment, uh, sorry, the etiology for the effusion. And so you may perform a diagnostic pericardiosynthesis, particularly in patients with malignancy or where you really don't know the cause of the effusion. So for the diagnostic dilemmas, what are the most common diagnoses that you're thinking about? And what are the common labs you would order, both from the pericardial fluid and the blood to try to get to the bottom of it? That's a great question. So a lot of that diagnosis is based on the clinical history and the examination and what you think is likely or unlikely. In terms of what we routinely do on all our pericardial fluid samples is we always worry about infection as a potential etiology, although unlikely. And so we tend to do cultures, aerobic and anaerobic cultures on all, all the pericardial fluid that we send off. The other thing that we tend to do is you often wonder, is there a malignant cause of this? And patients don't infrequently have a history of malignancy. And so we typically perform cytology. With cytology, it's really important that we send the entire volume of fluid because the laboratory is going to spin it down and only take the cells at the very bottom. And so if you don't provide enough fluid, it decreases your diagnostic yield. As for other things, it really depends on the story. If you're worried about a risk of uh, tuberculosis, then you would do tuberculosis cultures. And you would really sort of tailor uh, your um, sort of diagnostic assessment based on the history there. Sure. Um, so let's talk more about the procedure and how it's done. And, you know, in my mind, um, imaging is critical to pericardiosynthesis because we're trying to get into what can be a small space and an unevenly distributed space. And seeing where you're going is always a good idea. And I'd like to focus our conversation around predominantly echo-guided pericardiosynthesis as opposed to the fluoroscopic access in an empty pericardium, sometimes done for therapy in the EP lab or, or cath lab. So tell us a little bit about the, the techniques that are preferred in the approach. So I agree with you, Paul, that, you know, really imaging is a good idea to have. And if your echo is easily and readily accessible and so it's often used along with the pericardiosynthesis, and in some centers they use CT rather than echo, it really depends on what the expertise at your institution is. Echo-guided pericardiosynthesis is a fairly easy procedure to perform. Uh, you use the echo probe to determine where is the pericardial effusion the largest and the shortest distance from the skin to the pericardial effusion to minimize your risk of traversing other structures. Now, if you can see the heart, that means that there is no air in the way with your echo. And so you can be reassured that you're not going to puncture lung. What we generally do is we hold the echo probe and try to determine the angulation and direction with which we are going to enter with the needle. We put a little bit of local anesthetic under the skin to numb the area and then infiltrate down to the pericardial space using a longer needle. We typically perform this using a standard 16 gauge intravenous catheter with the length determined based on how far the pericardium is to the skin. The reason for using a 16 gauge pericardial needle is that it allows you to pass a standard J-tip 0.3, sorry, 0.035 inch 
uh, standard wire through. And so once you get access with your pericardial, with your intravenous catheter, you can then confirm your position using agitated saline and you would image this from a different acoustic window. And so when you inject the agitated saline, what you're really looking for is bubbles filling the pericardial space rather than bubbles filling a cardiac chamber. If uh, you confirm that you're in the pericardial space, you pass the wire through, and then you want to pass a six French sheet with a dilator over the top of that, remove the dilator, insert a pigtail catheter. Usually we have the pigtail catheter connected to a three-way tap, and one of the ends of the three-way tap connected to a, to a bottle, uh, with a vacuum bottle to sort of aspirate that pericardial to dry, pericardium to dryness. And it's our standard procedure to leave the pericardial drain in place at the conclusion of the procedure to sort of minimize that risk of recurrence. So a couple of questions. First, is there a standard position that the patient is placed in for the access? Ideally, the patient is placed in the supine position uh, so that they're stable, they're comfortable, um, and they're uh, really quite not going to move around during the procedure. It is possible to perform it in other positions. We have done some in the left lateral position where the windows are not good enough in the supine position, but really that's less ideal because of the ability to keep your patient stable uh, through the procedure. In terms of the angulation of the bed, I think you know it's important to get the patient in position before you image them. You really don't want to move them around after you've imaged them because you want to make sure that you're going through where you think you're going through. Now, for people who don't do these procedures routinely, but maybe care for them in, you know, in the hospital afterwards, what, what are the sort of standard care pathways in terms of leaving the drain in place, pain control, um, other things to be aware of with regards to management after the, uh, the effusion is drained? Sure. Um, so in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, we always leave a pericardial catheter in place. The reason we do that as opposed to removing the pericardial catheter is that we find that pericardial, the pericardium exudes a fair amount of fluid early on, and we really want to have the pericardium nice and dry to avoid the need for a repeat procedure. And so we tend to leave that pericardial drain in. And what we do is that we flush and aspirate that catheter every six hours. And so we'll flush it with about five cc's of sterile normal saline, and then aspirate all the pericardial fluid that we can get off. Uh, we then lock the, cath lock the pigtail catheter with about three to five cc's of saline as well. Now, we some patients have a lot of discomfort with the catheter in, and certainly on exam, you'll often hear a rub an ECG obtained with a catheter in place often shows very dramatic pericarditic looking ST segment elevation. And uh, some have advocated injection of lidocaine into the pericardial space while the drain is placed. Can you comment on that? Absolutely, Paul. And you're absolutely right that some people have quite marked pain. And so pain relief is really, really important in order to let you keep the pericardial catheter in place. And so we tend to use 10 moles of 1% lidocaine, of course, without epinephrine, and inject that through the pericardial catheter into the pericardial space. We typically give that up to every two hours as the patient requires with a little flush afterwards. How long does the drain usually stay in? So the drains, on average, stay in between three and four days. Some, it really depends on the drainage from the pericardial catheter. If we really look, it's really important that we chart the net drainage, and we're really looking for a net drainage of less than 50 cc's over a 24-hour period. It's important to remember that it's a net drainage because we are injecting a fair amount of saline to flush and aspirate our catheter each time. But we tend to be very patient-specific, and it's whenever the patient's pericardium dries up and it decreases to that mark of less than 50 cc's. In our experience, that's typically three to four days on average. Got it. So we have a patient that have a large effusion. You drained it. Um, the hemodynamics look good. They're in the hospital. There's a drain in place, and they've got an excellent pain regimen in place. So they're lying comfortably in bed. Um, what complications should we be looking for following this procedure, and how likely are they to happen? 
of, most of the complications with this procedure happen intraprocedurally. So the things that you're, that, that you're worried about are the risk of puncturing the heart when you put the pericardial, when you perform the pericardiocentesis. This tends to be fairly well tolerated by the, par by the patient, generally speaking, provided that you merely make a puncture of the heart with your 16 gauge needle and don't dilate. So it's really vitally important that you check and make sure and confirm that your needle is in pericardial space before you proceed to dilate it with the dilator and the large uh, six French sheath, because at that point it would be too late to do anything other than cardiac surgery to salvage the situation. How and, often um, are there complications that require management? So those, those are said to be about one in a hundred or so, but in experienced hands, they're fairly infrequent in terms of, of complications. And the outcomes are generally very good here at Mayo Clinic. Um, the other potential complication is the risk of traversing uh, the pleural space and causing a pneumopericardium. As I mentioned earlier, we try to avoid the, the pleural space as much as is possible, but that's a potential risk which may necessitate a chest drain. Um, there's a risk of, um, of injury to the, to the liver or, or injury to other structures resulting in bleeding. And so if you, we ideally look for what is the shortest distance. And so about a third of our pericardiocentesis are performed by it the subcostal approach while the majority are performed by other approaches. And really the, the key is if you're performing a subcostal approach, pericardiocentesis, to really try to hug uh, the inside of the, of the costal margin rather than angulate more uh, posteriorly into the liver. Sure, sure. Um, once the pericardiocentesis is done, do you routinely start any medications or um, any treatment following the procedure? So as you mentioned earlier, Paul, these can result in a fair bit of inflammation with overt, per, uh, with overt pericarditis, as you mentioned, the ECG changes and everything else and the pain associated with it. So my routine belief is that there is some degree of, of pericardial inflammation at the conclusion of these procedures. And so my routine practice tends to be to give my patients colchicine. Usually this is based on weight. Most of our patients are on 0 0.6 milligrams twice a day of, of colchicine, unless they're on the smaller side. So if a patient is less than 70 kilos, I may decrease that to 0 0.6 once a day and adjust depending on patient tolerance. The other thing that I routinely give my patients post pericardiocentesis, if there is no contraindication, is a short course of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories usually over a couple of weeks at high dose, namely about 600 milligrams of ibuprofen three times a day, and then to taper it at that point uh, over the next week or two. So a few weeks of um, uh, ibuprofen and then that gets tapered. And how long do you give the colchicine for? Typically I give colchicine for three months. There is no strict guideline that tells us how long to give uh, to give colchicine post-procedure. And this has been variable amongst colleagues to vary anywhere from one month to three months. And it really depends on the patient's pain control and how quickly they come off the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Yeah, maybe make a comment about steroids, which uh, obviously will control pericardial symptoms, but introduce a whole new level of, of challenges. Absolutely, yes. So steroids, definitely an alternative to other anti-inflammatories, but you're absolutely right that it, it brings in a whole new level of, of issues. Typically, um, steroids have been associated with an increased risk of recurrence of pericarditis. And so generally, we try and avoid steroids wherever possible. However, there are some people with really marked inflammation, non-responsive to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, who really do benefit from the addition of steroids. I find that the biggest mistake with giving steroids is the desire to give steroids in sort of an asthma dose pack sort of regime where you start at a really high dose and you attempt to taper off in a week or two. The pericardium really doesn't tolerate a rapid steroid taper. And so it's really important uh, that if you initiate steroids, you're going for a dose of about 
0.25 milligrams per kilogram. So typically, I started a dose of 20 milligrams of prednisone, and that suffices for most patients rather than higher doses, which may give more rapid pain relief, but will result in a much longer steroid taper. Um, it's important to taper these people really, really slowly. And so you're looking at 2.5 milligrams for a taper every couple of weeks until they're off therapy. So it's really quite a long duration of steroid before you have them off steroid altogether. And I find that's the biggest error that people make, that they put people on steroids and then they take them away very, very quickly. And that frequently results in recurrent pericardial pain and maybe recurrent pericardial effusions as well. So if I can summarize, then a good rule of thumb is whenever possible, avoid steroid use, but with a combination of colchicine and a non-steroidal agent, if steroids are required, taper very slowly uh, and um, uh, to successfully wean the patients off. Last question I have is this, and it may be difficult because the patients who undergo pericardiosynthesis are so heterogeneous, but maybe any general comments that you could offer on follow-up testing, that is, you know, how often and when do you get a follow-up echocardiogram, ECG, inflammatory markers, other, other things that can be useful in assessing someone's response to pericardiosynthesis and whether any additional intervention is needed? Now, that's a great question, Paul. And, you know, I think it really depends on what the underlying etiology of the pericardial yeah. infusion is. Unfortunately, the difficulty is most of the time your lab results are not back by the time patients go home. Your cultures are typically ongoing for five days before the lab uh, calls it a day at that point. Uh, your cytology typically takes a week to come back. And so, unfortunately, you really don't have the results at the time you send the patient home. If the effusion has been, you know, is not due to cardiac perforation, if the patient has tolerated the procedure well, um, if they've not had a history of recurrent effusions with tamponade, it may be reasonable to bring them back in about four weeks or so, at which stage you'll have all the results available. You can re-echo them at that point to make sure they haven't re-accumulated. They should be getting off the therapy with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories weaned at that stage. Uh, culture scene, either you know, getting close to the end or having a little bit more left to go. And so that's a reasonable time frame that I find sort of the four week mark. If you're worried about a patient, then bring them back earlier at the one week mark uh, to, to look for recurrence. But in most cases, my rule of thumb has been about four weeks or so post pericardial synthesis if possible. Dr. Alan Luis, co-director of our Pericardial Disease Clinic, thank you for joining me. It's been a great discussion. Thank you very much, Paul.